Thank you very much, Judge, and thank you, um, the British Academy of Audiology, for um, that honour. It's, it's a great pleasure to be asked to come to the meeting and to be able to give um, a talk this morning. I thought, well, what title would I give it? I, and I remember when I first came to an audiology meeting, which was probably 1968, um, hearing an amazing talk about paradoxes in hearing research. And I thought, I'll just chase that chap up, Professor Haggard, and say, what were those paradoxes, and have we resolved them? But he can't find it, and I couldn't find it either. And one of the paradoxes is that the more slides you've got, the less you've got to say, and the less slides you've got, the more you've got to say. And, and I'm afraid that this has fallen into two stools. Um, my wife said this morning at around about four o'clock, hadn't you better get on and, and, and rewrite your talk? I thought, oh God. <laughs> and I fell out of bed um, and, and restarted. And I think I've got them in the right order, if there was an order in the first place. Oh, that was the phone, yeah, clearly. Clearly somebody else has been elected somewhere else. It's a problem. All right, start my button on there. Um, so so as, you, as Judge it referred to, the, I, I have retired from Public Health England, um, and I've got this, uh, my own company that works for McCabe in my garden. Um, it stands for Communication, Audiology, Value, and Epidemiology. But it is, it is a cave, and my friends in the USA sent me, sent me a little plaque to put on it saying, Man Cave. And, that, and I was tempted, as, as people do, to show this vast campus that they work from, the fantastic resources they've got, and I've got my shed. <laughs> but it's amazing what you can get done with that and a phone when you don't lose it in the bar like last night. Um, I also work closely with um, Sue Archbold and now Melanie at the Ear Foundation, and I put up that I'm a patron there, and that means that I ask all of you to think about the Ear Foundation um, and maybe looking at some of the resources that they, they've got on board, because it, it is a, a fantastic place they've got there and a lot of fantastic things that they're doing. Now, Hurley Dingra, who's a good friend of mine in, in public health, held some workshops this, that, that said there are four different scenarios in public health going forward. And I think also we can use those scenarios in um, hearing health care. The first one, one step forward, half a step back. Fiscal constraints, we know about those slowly advancing our capabilities. We know more, we have more technology, we're a bit slow at introducing it, but slowly advancing we do. Automating processes, getting better analytics to improve what we do. Um, but this is here for global public health, and, and this is something I'm getting to grips with. Climate change challenges us, and those challenges continue to grow. We have little progress in improving the social determinants of health um, in terms of poverty, in terms of um, the education and, and other th income and so on, are hugely limiting in terms of public health. And I believe also in terms of building up our hearing health as well and, and in conditioning how hearing health care works. The second, which I've given one star, is overwhelmed, under-resourced. And as I go around the country or listen to people on the phone, this is, this is the major message I get from those working in hearing health care, that we know very well what we want to do, but we're overwhelmed by patient demand and expectations by what commissioners expect of us, and we feel that we're under-resourced. 
Now, I think that's, that's a very real scenario. And I've gone on to two star, where I think some people have gone and saying, OK, what we want to do is facilitate community transformation. So if we look at some of the services that you run, you've gone out there to the community and made a huge change in um, involvement of families, of patients, uh, and people that you serve. Um, and I think that that, to me, is, is the next stage in, in where a lot of us are going. But if we go to the four star, I think, and this is in terms of public health and I think in terms of audiology, where we work with partners with local health improvement initiatives using technology, using social media, um, and really um, getting commitment both in terms of self-management, self-care, which is there, I don't, oops. Oh, is that mine? That's not mine. Somebody else's. <laughs> so we have self-care here um, and community care here. And, and I think that the, what we need to do is, is shift our values towards the self-care and the community care here. Um, and in public health, this is where people are aiming to go. And I think that we ought to think about this as, as a model for hearing care. So, as, as you know, I've been trying to think about network-driven audiology systems, where we have networks of, of services, where you share information, you determine the vision, and you look for the equity across services. One of the things that I get asked most by people is where can I get the best service for my child or for my parent or grandparents? And I said, well, we haven't really got a metric that says this, this bit in Middlesbrough is better than this bit in Exeter or this bit in, in Barnet is better than this bit in Harrow. Um, but we're getting there. Um, and I said, yeah, but who should I go and see? And I said, well, yeah, you could go and see her or him or her there. Um, but we haven't, we haven't really got, like a lot of the medical services, a way that people can compare how well uh, the different services are doing. Can I get, get some more? So I can see even, even more today the need for the right information to be available for patients and commissioners and others to say, yeah, this, this is the sort of service you get here compared to just over the border here or 100 miles away here. Um, and, and as I know, having met many parents between 1968 and now, that parents some parents are prepared to drive the 100 miles if they have to, to get the better service or to get the person that they want for continuity of service. So driving these networks through information, through quality, and having a joined up vision, I think, is important. But again, we have a paradox here. If individual services are, are truly independent, and they work together, can they still be independent? And that's how, what we have to resolve in our paradox, is how can we truly work together and be independent? And I feel that the answer is in understanding the information and the data that we have from those services. I think that's really important. Pearlie's also got this um, dead horse theory um, and I don't expect you to read down the, the column there, but I think um, from my observational study, and of course that this isn't a meta-analysis or randomised trial, that, that we indeed have a dead horse theory in, in audiology. 
So the tribal wisdom of the Dakota Indians, passed on from generation to generation, says that when you discover that you're riding a dead horse, the best strategy is to dismount. However, in modern business, education and government, I include health in that, a whole range of far more advanced strategies are often employed, such as buying a stronger whip, changing riders. Yeah, we'll have some public sector and private sector coming in here. Threatening the horse with termination. <laughs> Appointing a committee to study the horse. This is, this is my favorite. Arranging to visit other countries and other services to see how others ride dead horses better. This is, this is the one I'm often accused of, which is lowering the standards so that dead horses can be included. Reclassifying the dead horse as living impaired. No pun intended. Hiring outside contractors to ride the dead horse. Harnessing several dead horses together to increase their speed. Providing additional funding and or training to increase the dead horse's performance. Doing a productivity study to see if lighter riders could improve the dead horse's performance. Declaring that as a dead horse does not have to be fed, it is less costly and more cost effective carries a lower overhead, and therefore the contribution is substantially more to the bottom line of the economy than to some other horses. Rewriting the expected performance requirements for all horses, promoting the dead horse to a supervisory position, <laughs> and hiring other horses. So, I think you can recognize within that different strategies that have been used by governments and by um, healthcare providers and might be applicable in our, in our context. What we've got to do is recognize what the dead horse is, horses, dead horses might be, and think, yeah, we have to get off and do something differently. So I think that we need to create another platform to replace the dead horse from which to advocate for parity for sensory health. I believe that sensory health is the precondition to cognitive health, which is the precondition to mental and physical health. So in terms of the, as, as it were, the pyramid of health, I put sensory health and hearing in particular as being the most important element of health. And the paradox to me is, others don't recognize that. I'll come back to that towards the end of my talk. Is it a problem with me and with us, or is it a problem with them that they don't recognize um, the absolute um, supremacy of sensory health and hearing in particular? If we can't sense, then we can't make sense of the world. If we can't make sense of the world, the brain has to go into overdrive to try to understand it. And therefore, there's less, at less attention given to um, sensory activity in vision and in hearing and in balance, touch, taste and smell. So I think that, that the platform has to be population-led with patients and their families and their organizations, health professionals of all kinds, medics, scientists, and therapists. We have to improve our hearing health system networks, working together, defining the scope of those systems, defining the exchange of data about the health of, of hearing health, and encouraging transparency and open data about hearing and other aspects of health and daily living. That's the number of slides left, five. So, <laughs> so 
The, the important thing here is this last line. What we have to do above all else is pursue high value activity and think about low value activity and how we can stop low value activity. Because that is the only scope I think that we've got. So there are hellish decisions in hearing healthcare. High value activity is underused, so auditory implants, hearing aids, ALDs, innovation in the pathways that we use. All of these, all of these high value things are, are underused out there, but low value activity is overused. And I'm thinking of some children's services, second tier services maybe, GP treatments for tinnitus, dizziness, and hearing loss, and the lack of use of, of technology. So actually not doing something is something we need to give up. <clears throat> Unwarranted variation in hearing health care. We have no data, but we have a lot of information, and we're not using it. It's a question of how do we curate that? Is that a role for BAA? How do we look at the quality of that data that individual de departments have and use? There's been the American Academy of Science published a report with many recommendations, one of which was to introduce an over-the-counter type of, of hearing aid. And, and a bill has gone before um, the House in, in Washington, in the USA, about this already. And, and I think that the USA was determined to look at affordable hearing health care, and it would have had a big impact on what we do. As I've said, I think it's going to be Trump's. <laughs> so, so I think we can, we can look forward to those, some of those things being rushed through, but without the evidence that might otherwise have been there. If you can think about paradox, what is it? How can we learn from it? It's basically the juxtaposition of principles. Um, and what are the principles that we hold dear as a profession? Well, first, do no harm. And for those of you, Margaret McCartney is a Glaswegian um, who's written a book about the patient paradox um, and living with dying. Living is the only terminal condition, I think, <laughs> she puts it. How many of you have, have read Margaret McCarthy's book? McCartney's book. It's well worth looking at. It questions a lot of what we do um, in terms of screening um, and about how we're not doing good, but we are doing harm in some ways. And we're not living by the evidence that's out there we're not being open and transparent. We don't treat people with dignity and respect because we don't give them the information that they need to make decisions. Another way to look at paradox, um, this is a poem from uh, William Blake. He who binds himself, he who binds to himself a joy does the winged life destroy. But he who kisses the joy as it flies lives in eternity's sunrise. So essentially, um, it's just a paraphrase of the Beatles, isn't it? It's can't buy me love, whatever. But if he was talking about butterflies, and if you capture the butterfly, then the joy is gone because the butterfly is no longer. And I think we need to, we need to think, how do, we, how do we, with our principles, think about how we can do more with less, how we can use technology more, yet give people greater respect and dignity, give them the time that they need to tell us about their issues. But the paradox of early intervention. Now, newborn screening, I think, was an amazing thing. Um, when I first came into audiology, a slight narrative here, um, I went to see Beth and Davis, who sadly passed away um, 10 days ago. Um, and um, she introduced me to a lot of people in Finland and elsewhere who said, Adrian, you don't need um, newborn screening in England because you have the health visitor distraction test. Well, we found that that was probably 
and, and over exaggeration. We had the health risk of distraction test. It may have done some good, but in terms of the process measures of, of being able to intervene early and bring families forward earlier, um, newborn hearing screening does that. But does that imply that earliest is best? We have to think about that for newborn screening, for adult screening, and other sorts of screening. So what Margaret McCartney says, the paradox I keep finding with the NHS is if you are ill, you have to be persistent and determined to get help. GPs have to be persistent too. Yet if you are well, you are at the risk of being checked and screened into patienthood, given preventive medication for something you'll never get, or treated for something you haven't got. And patently, that's not true um, with either newborn hearing problems or adult hearing problems. Um, that 50% of, of folk over 70 have a hearing problem, yet 60% of them get no support for that hearing problem. So we know the impact that hearing problems have, the burden of hearing loss, both in England, Scotland, and globally. We know there's a large variability in services, and we lack comparable data um, to, to compare those services. So we need to be radical about hearing loss, I think, and start a movement now to promote the, the importance of hearing loss and the care that's needed to support those people with it. Now, is there a thing to jump to the last slide? Just keep going. You can see there's lots in here somewhere. Oh, there was something that's in Health Survey England. 14% of adults have objective hearing loss at 1 kilohertz, 13% at 3 kilohertz. Those who use hearing aids have less mental health issues than those who don't for a given degree of hearing loss. And similarly, in terms of well-being, people who use hearing aids have better well-being than those who don't for a given hearing loss. 60% of adults aged 55 and over with hearing loss who could benefit from a hearing aid had never used one. These are findings from the Health Survey England 2014 that were published this year. Muir's book, Sod 70, he said, unfortunately, Adrian, you were ill, so I wrote the bit on, on hearing loss. <laughs> um, Roger McGough talks about growing old and problems with hearing and things like that and says, if anyone says to you, what do you expect at your age, hit them. Could have been written in Glasgow, I guess. So, as we stride on involving... Uh, oh. Sorry, guys. There was, there was a lot of data in here somewhere. The important thing is from the, from the demographics, in the next decade, need and demand will increase by at least 40%. So what can we do? What we used to do was throw money at it with something like newborn screening, modernizing hearing aid services. Uh, but we can't do that anymore because there's no more money. Um, and what I would suggest is that the, un the major underuse of high value interventions in health um, is provision of hearing aids for people with hearing loss. Um, and we need to do something about that. Um, there's lots of hidden links in this stuff. I ran a hack session in the World Congress of Audiology to ask people what they thought were the major priorities um, to put into such a platform. And they felt hearing health education at a very early age in school, similar to dental health, was the number one thing that they would, that they would promote. Improve medical education, get a broader view of hearing and crowdsourcing 
um, for, for some of our sort of community-based solutions. What, what I would like to do is to build a data platform um, to have a register, for instance, of those with auditory implants, maybe 10,000 people, to have um, a similar one for the use of aids to hearing, which may be a million people, three million probably use hearing aids, but if we get a million people to sign up to that, that would be really good. So those, I think those are the sorts of things that I would do. So coming back to get a community-driven um, audiology service, we need to, we need to we we need to get the data in that shows what a, what a big deal it is and what great improvements we can make with our hearing health care. Sorry, judge it. <laughs> I shall disappear in a puff of smoke. Ah.